Hi, this is Dr. Bob Dan Huffer, Public Health Officer from Douglas County. We're having a few issues today, so please, please bear with us here. All right, great. Hi, so Dr. Bob Dan Huffer. It is uh, February the 26th, and we're going to go ahead and do our Facebook Live today. Again, this is a time for you to ask questions, and we'll try and get those questions answered as best we can. It seems like every day I go around town and see people who, who say, oh, I just watch it and love it and good. Um, I'm not sure how much people learn from this, but people have been very grateful in saying that they've learned a lot. So we'll go ahead um, and answer your questions. So as always, what we do is we start at the top at the world level and then move down and then talk about the nation, the state, and the local deals, but mostly this is a time to answer your questions. So from the world, this is still a very active pandemic. We're at 113 million cases and 2.5 million deaths. And while things are clearly better than they were before, the U.S. had 2,400 deaths yesterday. And if a year ago, which is just about when this started, I would say on February 26 next year, we're going to be celebrating because we were down to 2,400 deaths. People would have thought I was crazy. And yet, we're going down to 2,400 deaths, and we celebrate because it's better than it's been before. So the good news is we are coming down. The bad news is it's still pretty bad. Still very active in the U.S., France, Italy, and, two in and three interesting places. One is Brazil, and Brazil is especially concerning because Brazil has had a tremendous amount of disease for many, many, many months now. And the thought was that Brazil would already, through natural infection, be at herd immunity, and that the disease will end in Brazil. Unfortunately, what they're seeing is that places that in the, in the late spring and early summer had lots of cases last year, maybe as many 80% of the people in the community had the disease, are now seeing another wave, perhaps due to new variants, perhaps due to the fact that natural immunity from their first infections back from that time waned. So that's really a cautionary tale. The two other places that are interesting are Sweden, remember, uh, three Scandinavian countries, Norway, Sweden, Finland, uh, three Scandinavian countries fairly similar in their makeup and in their background. And as almost like a natural experiment, they decided to do things differently. So Norway and Finland took much of what we consider the Euro European approach with lots of closures and lockdowns and whatever. And Sweden took a more laissez-faire approach where they didn't have those things and uh, we, we get a chance to see the difference. So early on, Sweden had a lot more cases than Norway and Finland, and the thought was, well, that was going to, because they were going to build a herd immunity, and then they would have no more. But what we've seen instead is that Sweden continues to have a lot of cases. It's been really hard to eradicate in Sweden, and they've had to have some now lockdown measures, whereas Norway and Finland on their borders has always been tougher had, le had been more restrictive, and they've had a lot less cases, about five times fewer cases and fewer deaths in those countries per million than in Sweden. So again, this is going to be an interesting thing that will be talked about for years and years. The third is Israel. So Israel, Jordan, the Gaza are all having lots of disease. Uh, Israel has the highest immunization rate of anywhere in the world, and they think it's working, but it's not doing that much to stop new infections. So I think that what that shows us is that vaccines are great. It will certainly decrease hospitalizations and deaths, but may take a while until it really reduces infections. In the U.S., we're at 29 million cases and 521,000 deaths. Again, if a year ago, and it's just a year now since Oregon had its first case, I had said that um, uh, we would have 521,000 deaths in the U.S. People, again, would have laughed. Still very active in California, Texas, Florida, New York. And there's still 20 cases with more than a, 20 states with more than 1,000 cases a day. I mean, that's, that's, that's a lot of cases in a day in these states. So although things are much, much, much better than they were a month ago, we're still clearly not out of the woods. Oregon, as a whole, has continued to have a very low rate, actually one of the lowest rates in the country, uh, except for Hawaii, which has done very well with this. But we've had a low rate of cases, low rate of deaths, low rate of hospitalizations. Douglas County, on the other hand, so Douglas County has had been more open over the last eight weeks. Over the last eight weeks, um, bars and restaurants have been open for in-person usage. Gyms have been open. Most of the schools have been open. So most of the open schools in the entire state have been in Douglas County. 
And after eight weeks of that, we're seeing an increasing number of cases. Now, I think the number of cases peaked probably last week, a little lower this week, but we're still seeing a lot of cases. We're seeing cases in nursing homes. We're seeing cases in businesses, and especially in the businesses where they're spreading. So again, it's one or two guys at the business to start with, and then it's six, and it's eight, and it's 10. So it's really spreading there. And we're seeing a lot of cases associated with schools. This doesn't necessarily mean that the cases are spreading in the schools, but they're associating, they're associated with schools because it's either teachers or students who have the disease. Uh, the school outbreaks cause lots of problems because there are usually a lot of people who get quarantined at the time, and so there's a lot of people who get put out of put out of business for the 10 days or so that they're quarantining. And also deal because many of these kids have parents who, parents or older brothers and sisters who have other connections. And so we start to see a lot of connections. So we, for example, we were looking at a case today that had kids in two different schools, uh, an older kid who was working, somebody working in a nursing home. So it really spreads around the community when this disease is there. So it's still, still problematic. But the best news of the day, third vaccine, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine got approved and I'm sure we'll talk about that, but let's get to your questions. All right, let's see what we got here. So the first question, it says that in Douglas County, it appears that about 2% of the people who have tested positive have died. And so that's about right here in Douglas County. And so that is the number of died over the number of people diagnosed is called the infection fatality rate. The infection fatality rate, if you look in the world, is about 2.3%. In our country, it is about, right, there's 29 million cases and that is about 1.6%. Douglas County is around 2%. That is totally related to the age of the population. So for example, if you were a population where you had all young people, you should have an infection fatality rate of less than 0.1, right? So that if this was a college and you had a thousand cases in the college, you certainly would not expect even one person out of that thousand to die. Unfortunately, if you were at a nursing home where everybody over, over 80, you might have as many as 10% of the population die, so it's totally dependent upon your age distribution. Douglas County has one of the oldest populations in the state and actually one of the oldest populations in the country. So if you'll look at the age distributions in different areas, Douglas County and Coos County have some of the oldest populations in the country, and thus not surprising that our infection fatality rate is higher. We did the analysis looking at the infection fatality rate in the different uh, counties, and the age adjusted, if everybody had the same distribution of ages, is almost exactly the same. So we do have about 2% of the people tested positive in Douglas County have died, and that's, um, and that's problematic. But again, related to the fact we have an older population. So the numbers about how many positives were hospitalized and any estimates on how many people are out, able to stay out of the hospital. Now, the great majority of people do stay out of the hospital. Right, so that as we had 20 or 30 new cases a day over the last several weeks, we only had one or two hospitalizations. So again, if you take about 100 people who get infected, maybe 30 or 40 are going to be asymptomatic. Maybe another 30 or 40 are going to be mildly symptomatic. About 10% of the people are going to be fairly severely symptomatic. About uh, 5 to 10% of the population gets admitted and then about one to 3% of the population who gets this dies. And so that's about what we've seen. So overall, even if you get the disease, especially if you're young and healthy, your chance of getting very sick is pretty low. However, as we do see in the older population, so for example, in a nursing home, we do see a very high hospitalization rate, sometimes up to 20% and a high death rate. And that's what it is. So it really is related to, really re related to the age of your population. And can I also talk about the long haulers? So long haulers are the people who've had COVID and are not back to good within 28 days. So for most diseases that we get, most infectious diseases, by 28 days, people are feeling back to normal. Even serious disease like meningitis or pneumonia or sepsis, if you get over it, most people are feeling pretty much back to normal in 28 days. 
What we've noticed with COVID is that is definitely not true, that there are a lot of people three to four to six to eight months later continue to have symptoms. Uh, some people still have taste or smell disturbances. Some people don't have taste at all. Some people get their taste back and then lose it again. We had a case like that last week. Some people get their taste back, but when they get their taste back, everything tastes bad, burnt, metallic, or musty. That would be pretty terrible. Some people have chest tightness. Some people have chest pain. Some people have muscle aches. Many people report a tremendous decrease in their exercise tolerance. The good news is that as we follow the long haulers out further and further, more and more of them are beginning to improve. Certainly not all of them, but more and more are beginning to improve. So uh, there was one person who had about five months where they lost their sense of smell and taste and they were getting really demoralized that it was never going to come back. And then one day they could start smelling and tasting things and after a few weeks their smell of taste, their taste and smell was totally back to normal. So what we're hoping is in these long haulers that many continue to improve, but we don't know if there's some that will never fully improve or how long it will take. But, but the good news is that over the last several months, it's, it's, it appears that many of the long haulers are getting better. So Bruce says, with all the vaccines that have been given and all the trials, which vaccine is most likely to, ke to keep me from catching COVID? So with the vaccines, there's all kinds of different endpoints that you could use. So you could use the endpoint of, will this prevent me from dying, which I think for most of us would be, of all the ones we could pick, the most important. Could it, will it prevent me from getting hospitalized, which for me would be the second most important. The third would be, will it prevent symptomatic disease, third most important. And then will, will it prevent an asymptomatic infection, interesting but not really important to me if I have an asymptomatic infection because I would be asymptomatic. All of the vaccines are incredibly good at preventing death and hospitalization. The new J&J &J vaccine, which got approved today, actually was 100% effective in preventing death and hospitalization. Can't get much better than that. Uh, the Moderna vaccine is very, very good, although they did have one person who got in a Moderna vaccine who got hospitalized. The Pfizer was also 100% effective at preventing hospitalization, uh, preventing death and hospitalization. So all of the vaccines that have been approved and the J&J &J got approved today. So the J&J, &J, the Moderna and the Pfizer, all 100% effective at preventing uh, infection. The next is symptomatic infection. So I know I was sick and got tested. Uh, the Moderna and the Pfizer was about 94% effective at preventing symptomatic infection. Actually, the J&J &J came in a little lower at preventing symptomatic infection, but the J&J &J vaccine was tested at a time when there were a lot of variants, which is like the time now. The Moderna and the Pfizer were not tested against the time when there were a lot of variants. So actually, I think if you look at the data, they're, about, they're all about equally effective. And there's going to be a lot of uh, brand wars here. Which one should I get? How should I get it? I think really all of these are very effective vaccine. And I think you should get the vaccine that's available. So Bruce... You should get whatever vaccine is available. They're all incredibly good at preventing the serious parts of COVID, which is hospitalization and death. So you should get the one that's, that's eligible. So I'm 66 and called Evergreen to schedule my vaccine. They gave me an appointment for April 22nd. Is it really that far out? Hmm. Uh, so 66-year-olds are not eligible until next week. So they may have put you off during that time. And I think most of the clinics are working down in an age basis. There are a lot of people between 65 and 75, right? So people who are 65 are, are um, people who were born uh, as I was in the 50s, a time when there was a huge baby boom. Uh, the baby boom started at about 45. So there are a lot of people between 65 and 75, right? Guys came home from the war and, and uh, in the 40s, had a lot of babies. So we have this incredible baby boom, almost twice the number of babies born per year in the late 40s as compared to the Depression era or the early parts of the war. So, um, so there's a lot of people in that group. So yeah, people who are 66 may be pushed out a while. Now the very good news 
is that you know I've been talking about the absence of vaccine and how Douglas County got screwed and all this. I have been such a burr in their saddle. I'm sure when they see my name come up on the on the call log, on the emails, oh, God, that Bob Denhoff is going to bug me again about getting more vaccine. But I think it's finally paid off because in these next few weeks, we're going to get a lot of vaccine. So I think in the past, we've been averaging about 1,000 or 1,500 new doses a week. I think over the next few weeks, we're likely to get about 4,000. So we're going to get a lot new doses. So hopefully when we get this vaccine distributed, it can maybe move you a bit forward. The reason people are scheduled out is we have, we've asked people not to overpromise, you know, like, oh, we'll get you next week and then we don't have enough vaccine and then have to reschedule you. So hopefully now that there's more vaccine in, hopefully it'll come a lot, a lot quicker. So Janelle says, is it possible that there's a COVID variant here in Douglas right now? How would we know? Well, there's certainly a possibility it's here. So what we do is we send uh, samples where we're a little, little, um, a little suspicious. So, for example, we had a guy come back from Brazil who was sick. We were suspicious and sent that one off. This nursing home was a little suspicious because it spread a lot quicker than in the past. And this nursing home does an incredibly good job with infection control. And despite their good job with infection control and spread quickly, we sent that one off. So anyone that's a breakthrough, so you've had your vaccine and then get infected, we send those off. We send them all off. The problem, unfortunately, is it takes a long time to get them back. We have not seen any back yet. So it's certainly there's a possibly there's a variant there. And we'll know when we get the test back. But so far, we've not gotten them back. Um, yeah, so is there a timeline when set out for when frontline people working with the public can get the vaccine? The governor announced that today. It's a very long document, and I'm not through looking through it line by line. But if you look today on the OHA website, it was published, and uh, they say starting at the end of March, some frontline workers will get the vaccine. So you have to look at that today. So it's on the OHA website. It's the sequencing guidelines for the, um, for the end of March. Now, the sad news is it's the end of March. Um, so that is, that is a bit problematic. But, um, um, but we'll, we'll, we'll hopefully get those frontline workers in. So Jessica says, if you've had COVID, can you get it again? So a study came out this week that looked at people who'd had COVID in the past and whether they got it again. And about 10% of the people who had COVID get it, got it again over the space of nine months. Now, very few get it in the first three months. Occasionally, people will get it from the, thir from the third to the sixth month, and then occasionally after that. And we've seen a couple. So we had somebody who worked back east in the, in the big New York thing, uh, got it, came back as well, got it again. And so they think about 10% of the people after natural infection can get it again. That's, that's about as it should be. Ronnie says, do all doctors carry EpiPens for allergic reactions? Uh, I, don't, I mean, not, not necessarily in their, in their pockets, um, not necessarily in their pockets, but certainly anybody who's doing a vaccine has a vaccine reaction kit that contains all the medications and whatever you need. And so uh, any place where you get the vaccine, We'll have an EpiPen if you need it. Um, so my mother-in-law is over 70 and is waiting for a vaccine. Should she go to Coos Bay? I, I mean, sure. I mean, you should go wherever you can get a vaccine. Pretty much all the, the counties at this point are all sort of evened out. At one point, that was clearly not the case. Deschutes had a lot more than we did. Uh, Jackson had a lot more than we did. But it's all getting evened out now probably because I've been such a burr in the saddle. Uh, and so, sure, if you can get it in Coos Bay, that's fine. They're, they're no further ahead in Coos Bay than we are today. So if you, if you could get one, I'm not sure where her daughter is going to get one. So it's always a little confusing. Um, you know, you'll hear about, like, why did that person get a vaccine? Hey, they're, you know, they're 38 and healthy. But then you find out that they're a healthcare worker working in a nursing home and they should get it. So the rules on the sequencing are pretty complicated and that's why I don't usually, um, don't usually make judgments about that. So we found out today that the instructors and staff at UCC can get the vaccine on May 1st. Uh, so 
again, is very complicated because if you're a staff at UCC and you're 70 years old, you can get it this week. If you're staff at UCC and you're 65, you can get it next week. If you're 48 years old and have an underlying condition, you're getting it on March 29th. So there's a lots of confusion about that. It's all very, very case specific. So do we think colleges will be able to open in person by summer or fall? So um, there's a really famous physicist, uh, Niels Bohr, um, and uh, he was asked to predict the future. And he said, you know, predictions are really difficult, especially about the future. And then later they thought that was a Yogi Berraism. But uh, in any case, predictions are really hard, especially about the future, because there are so many things that can be different. Let me give you my best case scenario and my worst case scenario. So my best case scenario is that the vaccine deliveries that we're expecting come in as expected, that there are not a lot of big safety problems with the, with the vaccines, and that people get the vaccines and we're able to build up the number of people who are immune. People continue to wear masks and socially distance until the disease is driven down. That the variants, which we know are there, are there, and they're interesting for nerds, but they don't really make a big difference. The vaccines still work and they don't change things a lot. And nothing new or untoward comes along, right? You could have a variant which would be really terrible. You could have all kinds of things, but let's assume that all those things happen. So the vaccines get delivered. People continue with public health measures. Uh, the vaccine has no big safety signals and the variants are there, but not really important. In which case, I would think by July, we're in a much better time. And by September, we're not totally back to normal. I mean, I think you still would be cautious about international travel to a place that had not yet done vaccines. I think you would still be really cautious about what you do in a nursing home. I think I would still be nervous about flying or taking a cruise. But the other kind of things that we would normally do, like going out to restaurants, going to music on the half shell, going to a party, would all be much different than they are now and much more like September of 2019 than September of, of 2020. So that's my best case scenario. The worst case scenario is one or more things go wrong, right? So imagine if a new variant comes out for which the vaccine doesn't work. That really screws us. Imagine if we find out there's some safety issues with the vaccine. So far, we haven't seen any, but you know it could always happen. What happens if um, something else terrible happens and the, the vaccine manufacturers, instead of being able to do 600,000 doses, 600 million doses by the summer, have some big um, problem? And the big problem could be something so stupid as glass. So you have to make these vials, especially for the Pfizer, that can withstand these super cold temperatures. Now glass doesn't usually sustain such cold temperatures. So if you've ever uh, had glass in the freezer, sometimes it just shatters. Well, that's at a temperature of eight or 10 degrees Fahrenheit. These are supposed to be able to go down to 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So there's very, very, very special glass that needs to go into these Pfizer vials and there's only a couple places in the world that make it. So let's just say if something happens that the glass factory is burned down, which easily could happen, and now there's not the thing. So there's so many different things that could happen along the way, which would delay us out further and further and further. And people want to know when we're going to be totally done with this. We're not going to be totally done with this for a long time. You have to get everybody in the entire world vaccinated to get this done. And there's obviously huge swaths of Africa, huge swaths of South America, huge swaths of Asia, where it's going to take a very, very long time to get everybody immunized. But, you know, the best case scenario is that come this summer or the fall, things will get better. There was Dr. Jha was on, on TV today, today, and he said, well, if everything goes right, you can have a 4th of July or a Labor Day picnic in your backyard. I think he's probably right if everything goes right. Now, would I have a big indoor gathering? I probably would still avoid that. Would I travel on a cruise ship? Well, I'd probably avoid that. But by July or August, we could do that. And maybe by September, we could go back to schools uh, with very much fewer restrictions. So that's, that's what we're hoping. So Casey, that was a long answer to your question, which is, do I think colleges will be able to open in person by the fall? And the answer is, yes, if everything goes right, then they can. 
is everything going to do right? I don't know. Uh, so I heard that someone got their second vaccine two weeks after the first dose. Is that safe? Jessica says, well, it wasn't tested, right? So they only tested people two or three, uh, three or four weeks, depending on whether you got Pfizer or Moderna. Um, we think actually the best time to get the vaccine is a few months later. And so the AstraZeneca people found that actually getting the second dose six weeks after the first was optimal for making immunity. And that's kind of how your immune system works. So when you get a vaccine, the vaccine goes in, your body produces the proteins, the antibodies then get to, to, to working, the B cells and the T cells and all, they all get together and they make this initial response. Your best immunity is about six weeks later, which would be the time to boost it again. Um, so giving it two weeks after the first dose is probably okay. Uh, you know, we think that most of the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines are pretty darn effective after one dose. So we think it's okay. Now, I don't encourage people to make up new vaccine schedules, right? Because it wasn't tested with these new vaccine schedules. Well, what about two weeks and four days? What about this? It hasn't been tested, so I would kind of go along with the directions. But in your case, and the question was not exactly sure how you could have gotten the second vaccine two weeks after the first, because they should check. Is it safe? Probably, yes. So Linda said, if decided that we need a booster after the two doses, will you need to get the same brand as your first dose? That we do not know. So, you know, as this, very, as this virus changes, there may be a booster dose with the variants in them. And these vaccine technologies really allow for that. So uh, that's one of the great advantages of the mRNA vaccine is that changing what's in it is so much easier than it was before when you were actually making the protein. So, yeah, I can easily see that Moderna and Pfizer would come up with a booster dose that would have some of the original vaccine, some of one of the one variant, some of the other variant, some of the third variant, and that's what you'd get as your booster dose. I could certainly, certainly see that happening. And um, whether it will need to be the same brand or not, we don't know. So with outbreaks in senior care facilities, weren't they first to get the vaccine? Yeah, that's what we said too. So what we found was that of the staff, about half the staff got vaccinated. They were all offered, about half the staff got vaccinated, about half refused. Now that sounds bad, but that's kind of about the national average. And so about half refused. And what we saw was the people who got the vaccine were largely protected. Those who didn't get vaccine were largely the people who, who got it. For the residents, some residents refused, but we think most residents arrived after the Federal Pharmacy Partnership did the vaccines. And that's something that the Federal Pharmacy Partnership had, did not at all anticipate. And I shake my head like, how could you not have thought that there'd be new people coming to nursing homes? They totally miss the fact that when you live in a nursing home, people get better and leave, some people die, some new people come in, and they really didn't, they really didn't at all plan for that. So Richard says, so you're saying that even though you're 65 and older and eligible on March 1st, you're still, you still are weeks away from getting the vaccine? Possibly. Remember, there are 30,000 people 65 and above in Douglas County. 30,000. Uh, as of February 9th, we'd received enough doses to vaccinate 6,500 people. Now, we did get some in the last, few week, in the, in the last two weeks. But 30,000 people eligible, enough vaccine to vaccinate 6,500 people. So, yeah, we're way behind. And if you looked at the pre governor's press conference today, next week in the first week in March, we're going to be the furthest away from the number who are eligible as compared to the amount of vaccine. And that's why they're not adding the new eligibles until later in the month to give us time to catch up. So eligible is very different from we have vaccine waiting for you. But the hope is that by the end of the month, by March 29th, that every senior who wants to get vaccine can get vaccine. Uh, so Jim says, are, are the shots still given by age? Yes. 
even though there are people younger that are now eligible? I don't think so. So the younger people, people with pre-existing conditions, whatever, they don't, they, they, they don't start now. They start at the end of March, I believe. I think that's exactly what I saw. So, um, so that so that's what we're going to see. So March is really get all the seniors done. Now there's still some people in one A that haven't gotten vaccinated. These may have been healthcare workers that initially refused or were hesitant, wanted to see what happened with with the vaccines, and they are now eligible. Uh, every day we see new educators who same kind of story. Either they were newly hired or they didn't decide before they want the vaccine, but now decided they want the vaccine. Um, so that's what we'll see. But again, March is going to be our time to try and get all of the seniors done. Because when you look at the risk of getting sick or dying from this vaccine, age is far and away, far and away the best predictor. So I was asked to do this research thing this week to look at what the predictors were of, 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 of dying, which is you know, a very clear measure up from COVID. And so that if you use the, um, the baseline of somebody who is 15 years old, those people are not very likely to get sick. But as you move up to the 20s, it's 15 times the rate of that teenager. As you move to my age, it's about 300 times the rate of that teenager. And as you move to 85 and above, it's 8,000 times the rate of dying of that teenager. So when you look at that curve, it looks like your rate of your risk of dying doubles every seven years. So if my risk of, of die, my risk of dying is half of that of somebody who's 72, but twice that of somebody who's 58, and so age is far and away the best predictor. There's been a lot of talk about underlying conditions, but what 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 has been missed in much of the discussion is that underlying conditions tend to get more common with age. So, you know, there aren't very many 15-year-olds who have cancer. But as we now get to be our 50s and 60s, we get a breast cancer or prostate cancer or skin cancer or something else. There are not very many 15-year-olds who have COPD, but as we smoke and do the other kind of things, we pick this up in our 40s, 50s, and 60s. There are not many 15-year-olds who, um, uh, who have strokes, thank God. But as we get older, we're more and more likely to have that. So if you look at the different ages and you say, well, let's age adjust this. How well do pre-existing conditions predict your risk? The answer is not very well. In fact, once you age adjust, malignancy, smoking, diabetes don't really predict your risk of death. The only ones that really do are a history of stroke, a history of liver disease, and interestingly enough, being a man. So being a man increases your risk of death by about uh, 18%. Having a pre-existing stroke reduce, increases your risk of death by about 50%, but none of the other ones do once it's age adjusted. So again, the most important, the far and away the most important is age. And that's exactly what we've seen in our data here in Douglas County. We've had no one less than 60 die of this disease, even though there are a lot of people under 60 who have one of these underlying conditions, we've seen no deaths. And some of the people who were 16 and above didn't really have a lot. They were pretty healthy people. They may have had one little, one or two little things, but they were pretty darn healthy people. So again, age is far and away the best predictor. So Linda says, can I address what the commissioner said in their letter about not enforcing mandates while in, while in extreme? So that is totally political, right? So for public health, our sense is that people should do the right thing and we shouldn't have to have any laws, that people should recognize that during a time when there's a lot of disease around, that people should be really careful about gatherings. They should be really careful about wearing their masks. They should be really careful about not having big parties, regardless of where they happen. So what I've been saying all along, it's the behavior rather than the venue. So let's say I was going to have dinner with a dozen people. So... I was going to have a big dinner party, going to make some fancy dinner. I was going to invite a dozen people. Well, if I did that at a restaurant, that would be dangerous because it would be, say, a dozen people from five different households. That would be dangerous because if any of those people were brewing disease, they could infect everybody at the table. But whether I did it at my house 
or whether I did it in the back room at a restaurant, uh, it still would be equally risky. They're, they're both equally risky, so it's not necessarily the venue so much. It is the behavior. Since we can't really regulate behaviors particularly well, what we're asking people to do is voluntarily do those behaviors. So don't um, go to a bar and, and drink sitting with a bunch of friends and telling funny jokes and whatever, because that is a high-risk adventure. But if you decide, well, the bar is closed, we're going to just do this around my poker table, it's equally risky. So we're asking people to be careful about their behaviors. Again, the whole deal about closure of venues is so political, and I don't stay out of that. So Luann says, do I see COVID vaccinations being annual like flu shots in the future? Probably. Uh, so probably what you'll do is each year you get a probably a combination flu and COVID vaccine. Now the hope is that these mRNA vaccines have been so darn effective that actually rather than making the flu vaccines the way we make them now, we'll make them like we make the COVID vaccine because the COVID vaccines are so much more effective than the flu vaccine. I mean, the flu vaccine technology is the same we used in the 20s, the 1920s. And so what they do is... So anybody who's ever raised chickens knows in the springtime there's a lot of eggs out there. And so what they did is they would get millions of eggs. They inoculate the eggs with the flu, with the flu virus. They actually grow the flu virus in these chicken eggs. They then purify out the killed virus. And that's what the vaccine is. I mean, it is incredibly labor-intensive. There's, believe it or not, a job where somebody is cutting a little window in the eggshell. So their job is using a pair of, of really fine little scissors to cut this little window in the eggshell. And then somebody injects this carefully into the, into, the, into the fertilized egg. And then this fertilized egg grows it. Then they cull the egg and they, they get this really complicated, not very effective. And because it, it has... Living material has to have antibiotics in it because it's got living material. It's got chicken stuff in it. So for people who are allergic to either eggs or to chickens, this can be an issue. So this new one, if you made an mRNA vaccine, wouldn't have any of that. And because the mRNA is so much easier to raise than a million, millions of chicken eggs, uh, this may be the way to do it. So, you know, this is the Bob Danhoff for future, probably not for 2021, but maybe in 2022, you get your annual booster and your annual booster has both flu and COVID booster. And once a year you get that, instead of getting a flu shot, you get the combined COVID flu. And so I would hope we would get that by 2022. I don't know. So the flu year this year has been incredible. So, um, Normally, in Oregon, we have thousands of cases in the country, millions of cases. This year, there, in the whole country, of the 25,000 samples submitted to the CDC, only 14 are positive. I mean, that's, that's, that's incredible. You would sometimes have 14 positive in a day in Douglas County. So to have 14 in the entire country for a whole week be positive means that we've really gotten rid of the flu. So people say, well, that seems really fishy. How, what happened to the flu? And the answer is flu is, is wimpy in comparison to COVID. So for flu, there are already a lot of people immune because we got our flu shots. Flu, we think, is only uh, transmissible as droplets. So there's no convincing evidence that it spreads as aerosols. Yet, we think with COVID that some of the spread is by aerosol. And um, with flu, you, tip, you may be contagious a few hours before you get sick, but really only a few hours. And then it comes on really quickly, and you feel like crap if you've ever had the flu. So one of the things that's really particular about the flu is that kids say, you know, I went to school, I felt great. And then fourth period, boom, it hit me like a truck. And so maybe they were contagious a few hours before. But once you get hit with the flu, you're unlikely to go back to school COVID is really mysterious. You're contagious for two days before when you're still, stealing, feel, still feeling well. And for many people, uh, the first few days of the illness, it's like, I think it got allergies and maybe it's sinus. So they continue to go around and, and expose others. Plus, the basic reproductive number, how many, before we knew about this, how many people did you spread it to? Flu was about 1.3 extra people, so it could spread around. 
This one is over three, and I think it's over four. And so it spreads very quickly. So if you remember back to this Diamond Princess cruise ship, the Japanese cruise ship where there was one person and then 50, then 100, then in the end thousands of people, or the aircraft carrier, you just don't see that with the flu because flu is just not nearly as contagious as COVID. So why is flu gone and COVID not? Well, flu is much less contagious. Flu is much better contained by masks, and many people have already had the flu vaccine. And so for all those reasons, actually, if we'd seen a lot of flu this year, I would have been surprised. And it's not just flu. There's another, there's another virus out there called respiratory syncytial virus, which is the thing that causes this wheezy bronchiolitis in babies. Really, pediatricians hate it because every December, January, February, you get all these wheezy babies, typically two to six months of age, and they would be miserable and their parents would be miserable. And we'd be miserable because it's a miserable disease. This year, almost no RSV in the state. Again, because RSV is... Uh, not as contagious, well contained by masks, and uh, it just not spreading around. So most of these diseases, flu and RSV, typically come in through the ports as people travel to the U.S. And with less travel, more masks, uh, we're not seeing it spread. So Barbara says, if I understand right, my April 20th appointment may be moved up as more vaccines available. Absolutely. So. Until this week, we asked how many, how many vaccine doses people wanted. So a clinic would say, and I'll give the, the, the hypothetical clinic, we want 300 doses. And the other clinic would say, we want this. And altogether, there'd be a request for 3,000 new doses. Well, we only got 1,400 or 1,200, however many we got that month. That, so we would say, I know you wanted 300, but we can only give you 150. And we, and we did the decrements evenly, and we can only give you 150. Now, for the first time this week, we were able to come close to getting whatever everybody wanted. Not quite yet. I think by next week we will, but not quite. Um, yeah, Alicia said, any tips on getting vaccinated? Well... The good news, again, is the num amount of vaccine, especially in Douglas County, is going to really increase. And we think that some of that backlog, some of that will get back to you, is going to be better. We have been guaranteed a certain minimum number of doses a week, 2,500 new doses a week. And that's considerably more than we've ever had. Uh, so Lori says, is the new Ready School Safe Learners document by the governor required or a recommendation? Uh, so... Um, yeah, so the ready school say, so the decision on whether or not to open schools is made by the school board, right? So they're clearly made by the school boards and not by the state. Now the state and the school boards have this relationship and they decide what to do. Um, again, when the state puts out rules, we typically want to, we want to enforce it. So, you know, this, so let's go back. We have more and more questions about the mandates. Um, uh, so the story about the mandates is that, you know, we, I certainly talk with the commissioners all the time about these things, and I was certainly part of this whole discussion about enforcing the mandates. And the point is we do not want to be the police force. We want to be the public health force. And the public health force requires that when we call people, they talk to us. It requires they say, ooh, I'd really encourage you not to do that. So every, um, every day I get calls from people who are looking to plan an event. Um, uh, the Arts Festival, the Music on the Half Show, and they say, you know, Bob, what would be your recommendations? And for the most part, people are really, really, really good at following public health. On the other hand, you know, if they're thinking that I'm going to be the police force, that's, that they're going to tell me they're going to do this and then we'll shut them down, we're never going to get cooperation. So really, truly, what we're trying to do is we're trying to make this a cooperative effort. And the way to make this a cooperative effort is to do stuff like this, talk to people. If a bar calls me and says, hey, Bob, I'd really like to be open, I'd say, I'd say uh, you, know, I, you know, if you could hold off for a few weeks, that would be great because there's a lot of spread now. We know that when people are close together, especially not wearing masks, they can spread it. So we are looking not to be the, um, to be the enforcement thing. But again, 
this closure here is a is a is a state decision. It, it, it the state made the rules. The state is is doing that. And again, politically, the state can do what the state wants to do. Locally, we've made a decision that we want to work cooperatively with people. And when we call from public health, we want people to answer the phone. If I suggest to somebody that, ooh, that's a bad idea, I hope they'll follow the advice or at least um, at least be respectful about the advice. And that's where we, we, we tried to do it. So Alita says, can you get a vaccine if you're allergic to bee stings? Well, yes, you can. Now, we know that people who've had previous anaphylactic reactions, bad reactions to things, are more likely to have an anaphylactic reaction to this vaccine. Not because there are any bee products in this or any nuts in this or any peanuts in this, but it's probable that people who have anaphylactic reactions to bee stings or anaphylactic reactions to peanuts or something else just have really, really trigger hair immune systems. That is, their immune system, when it sees something that it's worried about, makes a big reaction where other people not, right? So we know people who eat peanuts all the time, never had a reaction at all, get stung by bees. It hurts, but they never get a reaction. And then other people who are exquisitely sensitive. So if you had a severe reaction to a bee sting, an anaphylactic or severe reaction to a bee sting, you are a little more at risk for having a reaction, still very low, still way less than one in a thousand, but a little bit more than if you've never had an anaphylactic reaction. So in your case, what would I do? Well, you can talk about it with your doctor. I think for most people who've had an allergic reaction, they should get the vaccine, and they should get the vaccine at a place where they're equipped to treat it, which in Douglas County is every place that gives the vaccine. So for example, we've had the big events at the fairgrounds, we've given several thousand doses at this point, we had zero reactions. So we have all the stuff there, the EpiPens and whatever there. We haven't even had to open them up yet uh, because the rates of, of allergies have been less. And, I, and I th what we think is it may just be any kind of shot. So the J&J &J had similarly had a few allergic reactions. But as we're starting to see more and more of the Pfizer and Moderna given, the rate of allergic reactions is, is, is going down. Now, some of these may have just been panic reactions. And I can tell you there are some people who just get really nervous about things. And when they get nervous, they break out in hives. I mean, there are some people like that. Um, um, they break out in hives. And you can imagine you could feel a little short of breath. Um, so is the J&J &J vaccine a live vaccine? And actually, this is a complicated question. I do not know how they're going to classify this. So, um, so what the J&J &J vaccine is, it's an adenovirus that cannot replicate, that has the genetic material. So this, J, this virus that has the genetic material can get into the cell one time, infect that cell, that cell will make the protein. The body will recognize that protein, make an immune response. And then that virus goes away. It doesn't replicate or anything else. So it's a viral vector vaccine. Now, typically when we think of live viruses, and we have some live virus vaccines, rotavirus that we currently give, measles, mumps, rubella, uh, varicella, and the old oral polio virus, those were truly vi live viruses. What they did is they take the virus, they take a virus that can replicate, but they weaken it or attenuate it along the way. So it's an attenuated live virus. So when you get a measles um, vaccine, you are getting a mild measles uh, infection. And so those are clearly vi live viruses. Um, the J and J is not live because it doesn't. It's not live in the traditional sense because it doesn't replicate, but it does get into, but it does get into cells as the adenovirus, and so I. This is a this is a a category of between inactivated and live. It's a viral vector, and so I think it's one of our first viral vector vaccines. So I don't think it, I, don't, I would not classify it as a live vaccine. 
I would classify it as a viral vector vaccine. But that's a complicated question, actually. A bunch of epidemiologists were arguing today about what we should call this. And I think in the end, their recommendation was that we call it a viral vector vaccine. But we do not know what the FDA is going to call it in the end. Okay, well, another question about the, the mandate. So again, as we've been in high for a long time, really since the beginning of this calendar year, we've been able to open things. So if you look, for example, at schools, most of the open schools in the state, if you look two weeks ago, were in Douglas County. So they had the state map of the, open, of the schools, red if they're closed, yellow if they're partially open, and green if they're open. And Douglas County was pretty much all green, and almost all of the counties around us were red. So we, we've been more open, a little bit more back to normal than other places. Bars and restaurants, although they had decreased capacity, were still open. And there's a place I have breakfast every morning, and it would be open. And instead of having the usual eight tables, they would have two tables. And you know, I'd sit at one of the tables and do my puzzle or whatever. So that was great. So people were able to circulate more. Um, today, when the new things have gone up, people are pretty much following the rules. You know, the restaurant had no in indoor seating. I've looked around. People are following. This is what we want. So the question is, so the mandates are a state mandate. Uh, and state does what the state does. In terms of what we're trying to do locally, we're trying to have people cooperate with our advice. And our advice is to be careful about those things where you spread the disease. Not wearing masks, gathering closely, be at a restaurant or at home. Um, mixing lots of families, like you do at a party, whether you did it at a restaurant or bar or in your back or in your garage, all and those are the things that we're asking people to do. And then we're asking people to cooperate with us. You know, many other counties have noted that uh, nobody answers the phone when you call them. We don't see that. There are a couple of people who are not interested in talking to us, but for the most part, people are very anxious to work with us and. They give us a lot of information, and they help us with things, and they tell them they might have been in contact with. So we've been really blessed by the cooperation that we've had. And the last thing we're looking to do is to squash that, that cooperation. So we'll see. Just do one thing here on the computer here. All right, so... All right. Okay. Well, a couple more things here. So the J and J vaccine, uh, you'll see when the efficacy comes out, it looks like it's a little different from the Moderna. Again, using the using, there are different vaccines at different times. So, for example, the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine tested against an endpoint of symptomatic disease in November and December, mostly at a time when before there were a lot of variants there. And they had two, two doses to do it. Whereas the J&J &J had a single dose to get to the efficacy. And it, was, um, uh, and it was tried in the UK, South Africa, Brazil, all places where there are both R variants and at a time when there were variants. So again, using the sports analogy, uh, uh, Moderna and Pfizer got two swings against a pitcher who could only pitch fastballs. And they were great. They had they they in, in every time they got a home run, which was preventing all hospitalizations and deaths. J and J got a single swing because they only had one dose against a pitcher who now knew how to throw a fastball, the old variant, plus a curveball, the British variant, plus a slider, the South African variant, and still. It batted a thousand percent in the important thing, which is preventing hospitalizations and deaths. So my sense on these vaccines, although the numbers are going to be different in terms of efficacy, I think they're all about the same. And to really know what you would need to do is a head-to-head -head at the same time in the same places, that is never going to happen. Uh, so I don't think we're ever going to get a good head-to-head, -head, just like you know, the question is how, how well would Babe Ruth hit against modern pitchers? Uh, I don't know. 
um, you know, how great would, uh, would uh, Bob Cousy be in the current NBA? I don't know. And so it's a different time and different background. And so I don't think you can do a, a one-to-one comparison. But I think what you could say is Babe Ruth was an incredibly great player. And Bob Cousy was incredibly great. And the current and LeBron is, is great. So they're all great. Comparing them together is one of those kinds of things. If you listen to sports shows, they'll talk about all the time, right? Like, oh, Babe Ruth was great, but you know he was a sort of a fat old man, and whatever. And maybe he wouldn't be so great in the current time. And the answer is, you don't really know unless you know what kind of competition you were playing against. So again, my view on this: Moderna is great, Pfizer is great, J and J is great. Which vaccine you should get? The one that you can. So if you can get one of the J&J vaccines now, you should get it. If you can get a Moderna vaccine, you should get it. If you get a Pfizer, you should get it. And so you should just get the one that's available. Now, the J&J vaccine will have some advantages. And so it's a single dose. And so that's going to be really an advantage for very mobile populations. So imagine, you know, if, you're going to, if you were going to uh, immunize seasonal workers, pretty hard to say, oh, and come back in four weeks. I said, well, in four weeks. I'm going to be at a different place. So really complicated to go ahead and do that. Maybe for people who are leaving the hospital to go to a nursing home, maybe it makes sense to get them one J&J before they go. We don't know. It just got approved today. So we haven't yet approved that. Um, so question coming here. Um, so we thought about doing a large event for seniors. Many can't get it at the doctor's or pharmacy. Well, the reason they can't is because there's not enough vaccine. And if you did a mass event, you would need to go ahead and take vaccine away from the doctor's offices and the pharmacies that currently have it. So until you, we had enough vaccine, doing a mass event didn't make any sense at all. Because if we did a mass event, then there would be no vaccine at the pharmacies or the doctor's offices, which we think is a better place to get the vaccine. Now, that may change. Remember, I have been this burr in the saddle of the people at the state, and they, they, they did a special thing for Douglas County, so about another 2,000 vaccines for Douglas County. So maybe if those really do arrive when they say they're going to arrive, we may then do a mass event for seniors. But we would not do a mass event for seniors and take vaccine away from the pharmacy and the doctor's offices. We would only do a mass event if we get enough doses in addition to what we already give to the doctor's offices and the pharmacies. So are we keeping track of people who get the vaccine and get sick? Well, actually, the feds are doing that through a system called the VAERS system, the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, V-A-E-R-S. And uh, people are doing that. And some people do get sick after the vaccine. Uh, predictably, people get sore arms, tiredness, um, sometimes a little low-grade fever, a lot of muscle aches, headaches very commonly uh, with this. Those are the kind of expected reactions. And then in anything, it was you're going to vaccinate millions of people within four weeks after they get vaccinated, things will happen. They'll get married, they get into car wrecks, they win the lottery, they get divorced. And some of those things are just going to happen when you do enough people. Are they related to the vaccine? Well, those things maybe not, but deaths may well be related. So what they're carefully looking at is, is the expected number of deaths with that many people and then the number of deaths that get reported. So let's say for a million people of certain ages, you'd expect 652 to die in the month, in the next month. And if you saw that in the vaccinated group, it was 2,000 versus the expected 652, you'd say, well, wait a minute, there's something wrong here. But if you expected 652 and 652 people died, then you'd say, well, it's probably not related to the vaccine. And that's where these very complicated VAR system is, is really working. Okay, I'm getting shoot out of here, so I have one more question. So I have a, I have a history of anaphylactic shock. Should I wait for the J&J vaccine? So initially we thought that that might be the case, right, because the J&J vaccine is a different kind of vaccine, and so that's somebody who might have an allergic reaction to the lipid nanoparticles in the, in the Moderna or the Pfizer vaccine might not have a reaction to the adenovirus. Uh, the problem, unfortunately, is about the same number of reactions 
in the J&J &J as, uh, as with the Moderna and Pfizer. And what's amazing is that there's nothing the same between them. You know, there's no lipid nanoparticles in this. There's no, in the J&J, &J, there's no adenovirus in the Moderna. There's messenger RNA in the Moderna and the Pfizer, but uh, different genetic material in that. So it just seems that when you give enough vaccine to enough people, you'll have some people who have a reaction. So we were thinking that perhaps before the data came out that people with a history of anaphylaxis should wait until the J&J came out. It appears today that that is probably not the case and that the risk of anaphylaxis among the three is very low. You know, one, only, only maybe one in 100,000. Unfortunately, that one in 100,000 to you is important. So if you have a history of anaphylactic shock, I would have you talk with your allergist, right, because presumably they're the people who helped you with, through your anaphylaxis, and see what they say. I think at a minimum, if you were going to do it, you do it at a place where they're well-equipped to go ahead and take care of an allergic reaction. Um, and then see. Now, there may be some people who don't want to get the, you know, they've had a couple of anaphylactic reactions, and they don't want to try it, test it again. And that's probably going to be okay, because it turns out that not everybody has to be vaccinated. Uh, again, if 80% of us are vaccinated, this disease will not spread in the community anymore. So not 100% of people need to get vaccinated. And there may be some people who just in the end don't get vaccinated. Personal belief, perhaps, maybe a religious belief that doesn't allow the use of, of vaccines, although there's not very many of those. Uh, maybe somebody who's had a terrible reaction to other vaccines in the past. Maybe somebody who's pregnant and doesn't want to get the vaccine during the pregnancy, although we think it's safe. But again, if those 3 or 4% of the people don't want to get the vaccine and everybody else got it, we'd still be okay. The problem is if, if a lot of people decide they don't want to get it for whatever reason, then we're not going to get to herd immunity and we're not going to get to the kind of society we want in September. So again, as we said earlier in the thing, you know, the very best case scenario, if everything goes right, variants don't cause a big deal, the vaccines get delivered as we expect, there's no safety signals on the vaccine, there's, the vaccines work as expected, and there's no other upheaval or whatever, really by the summer things could look a lot better. Uh, you know, if things go wrong, it could look worse. But that's why we're hoping that people go ahead and get the vaccine, uh, work with us to go ahead and do good public health measures before then. And if we do that, um, as the guy said on TV today, maybe we can have barbecues for the 4th of July. Wouldn't that be great? Anyway, uh, I'll leave you on that positive note because I know I've had a lot of negative notes over the, over the year. But anyway, be safe and, and be kind. Thanks. Great.